Today, I am going to talk about diverse models of leadership within the civil rights movement. So we're going to be actually looking at these two gentlemen who you see on the screen here, um, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. And they represent um, really two forms of leadership within the modern uh, 20th century civil rights era in a lot of sort of interesting ways. And whenever you ask people about the civil rights movement, they often will I should say when I ask students, I don't know about the general public, but when I do ask students about the civil rights movement, they can almost always identify Martin Luther King as a great leader from the civil rights movement. The second most popular person that kids tend to identify is Rosa Parks. And those are two very honorable, very great, important leaders from the civil rights era. But the fact that only a few students mention Mar uh, Malcolm X, I think is important uh, for a lot of reasons, which we'll sort of talk about over the next few minutes. So uh, let me just start by talking about Martin Luther King. Uh, a lot of you know plenty about Martin Luther King. We spend a lot of time in schools talking about him. People recognize his image. We have a holiday that is connected to Martin Luther King's birthday. And he is deserving in many senses of these, uh, these honors, this sort of honorable position that we place him in. He was born um, the son of a Baptist minister, lived in the South, in the segregated South, in the mid part and early part of the 20th century, and really does not raise to prominence until he becomes the leader of the Montgomery Improvement Society. We talked about the um, Montgomery bus boycott, which started in 1955 after the Brown versus Board of Education decision, and that uprising, that protest, that boycott, was started by an organization called, or it was coordinated, I should say, by an organization called the Montgomery Improvement Society. And within that organization, during that one year of protest and boycott within Montgomery, a young Baptist minister uh, rose to become a leader within that organization, and his name was Martin Luther King. And one of the reasons that King gained such prominence within the Montgomery bus boycott and became the leader there had a lot to do with his skills as a writer, um, his ability to really deliver a powerful message as an orator, and uh, really kind of bring all those qualities of a really strong, passionate, dynamic leader to the movement. And because of his success as the leader of this movement, Martin Luther King becomes uh, the head of an organization called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC. And so they take this inspiration from the Montgomery Improvement Society, and they take it to sort of a regional level, and they say, let's make a Southern, like, you know, this regional organization that will really work on um, bringing African-American leadership to the causes of civil rights. But it was also couched within the, the church. As I mentioned in a previous lecture, the church was always a place where African-Americans could go and could organize. It was frequently used as a uh, place where organizations um, were delivering messages and where the civil rights movement had its home base, in part because churches were a place that were were less um, intruded on by white America and um, white oppressive institutions. Although the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing is an example, one of the many examples, of churches uh, actually being bombed in the South and as the KKK and other white supremacist organizations started realizing that the churches were being used in this way. But nevertheless, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and dozens of churches, which became part of this organization, um, headed by Martin Luther King, begin campaigns throughout the South to civilly disobey and to use nonviolent resistance movements to actually confront segregation. And this is a mark of Martin Luther King and his leadership style. Martin Luther King believed in a biblical approach to asserting civil rights. He often referenced scripture in his writings, in his speeches, and he spoke like a preacher. He had the passion and sort of the fire of a Baptist preacher, sort of that traditional Baptist preacher's model. And this movement um, 
took on also the characteristics of nonviolence that Martin Luther King connected with the messages of Jesus of Nazareth, this uh, Christian um, spiritual leader. And so um, all of his messages, all of the movement itself really started taking on this, um, these, these tones. And in many ways, it was this Christian tone, this nonviolent tone that made Martin Luther King such a successful character, not just within the black community, but also within the white community. Martin Luther King uh, busted a lot of those images that white society had of the aggressive, dangerous black man. And instead, he became perceived as, by some whites, as a, a Christian, nonviolent, turn the other cheek, and a, a non-threatening African-American male. And this was a powerful piece of why he later was going to become a popular inside the black community and in the white community. And again, it's really important to keep in mind that having that connection and relationship with the majority white community is always important in any kind of civil rights battle. If it's only the minority group that's attempting to fight back against this powerful majority, then you're never going to have the full um, support that you need. You really do need to bring in people from that majority group. And the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Martin Luther King recognized the need to really communicate with white America and bring white America into this cause. And so approaching white America with these stories of the, the horrors of um, violence and the use of terrorism against African Americans in the South, as well as leaders like Martin Luther King, who were nonviolent, non-threatening, did not adhere to some of these mythic stereotypes of black men, had a really powerful impact on bringing whites into the movement. Martin Luther King, um, because of some of the work that he did, among some of the work that he did was writing some of the most important literature of the civil rights movement. Letter from a Birmingham Jail is one of the foundational primary source documents of the civil rights movement. This is a letter that Martin Luther King wrote actually while he was in jail in Birmingham, Alabama. He had been arrested because he and others had attempted to organize a march in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham had a really famous police chief named Bull Connor, who was a outspoken segregationist and who was uh, one of the people within the city of Birmingham who were very resistant to letting Martin Luther King and the civil rights marchers who wanted to march in Birmingham, he was they were resistant to letting them march. Martin Luther King and uh, his leadership team consistently attempted to use proper legal channels to get march permits for assemblies, for marches, and one of the techniques used against them was to actually deny them permits. When Martin Luther King and his team in, uh, in uh, 1963 in Birmingham were not allowed a permit, they marched anyway in violation of the law and were arrested. And so the uh, night that he was arrested in jail, he was given a newspaper. And this newspaper said, he, it was a, had an editorial in it from a group of ministers that actually were pleading with Martin Luther King to slow down. Things were getting too violent. Let's take this one step at a time. And the letter from a Birmingham jail is a response to this. And uh, it was actually written by Martin Luther King, scrawled in the margins of this very newspaper he had read this letter from, in which he says, we cannot slow down. We cannot stop. And he, again, references scripture, references examples of Christians in the Bible who stood up against um, oppression, stood up for what they believed in. And it's an incredibly passionate and um, dedicated piece of literature that very fiercely commits to this idea of pushing forward. Also his I Have a Dream speech, probably the most famous speech that has been given maybe in all of American history, in which Martin Luther King not only talks about his dreams, but he also um, talks about this blank check uh, 
that America promised African Americans freedom, promised them rights, essentially wrote them a check, and now it's time to cash that check in. So again, a message that um, while palatable by moderate whites was still in many senses assertive and asserting these, these rights. And he very famously becomes the first black man ever to receive the Nobel Peace Prize um, and gains international attention. So he becomes an international model of black uh, civil rights pursuits in the US. On the other side of the spectrum, we have this other guy um, standing next to Martin Luther King in this picture uh, on the, the right is, um, a man named Malcolm X. And the first thing people always ask is, uh, what's up with that last name? Sort of sort of funny. People, people feel a little bit um, surprised, not sure what that means. And um, it, the, the story of Malcolm X's name is part of the story of his life. So before I tell you why he has an X for a last name, let me tell you a little bit about Malcolm X. Now, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King have a fair amount in common, sort of interestingly enough, despite the fact that they were very different in some ways, they also have a lot of things in common. Unlike Martin Luther King, Malcolm X was not raised uh, in the South and did not live in the South. Um, he actually comes from Detroit. But he, too, is the son of a minister. And his father was an outspoken anti-segregationist, an outspoken opponent of the racism and racists living within um, Michigan at that time. Because of his speaking from the pulpit and speaking publicly about the rights of African Americans, Malcolm X's father had his hands and feet tied behind his back, his mouth gagged, and he was laid across railroad tracks in the switchyard in Detroit and was run over by a train. He was murdered by white supremacists, but because of the white supremacists that were in charge of the city of Detroit at that time, because police forces rarely defended uh, black people against white supremacist violence, even in uh, a northern state like Michigan, because of all of this, Malcolm X's father's death was not ruled a murder. Rather, it was ruled a suicide. And his mother really, uh, according to his autobiography, his mother really went through a serious mental collapse after this. It was um, her, her devastating loss of her husband, the violence and just awfulness of his, his death caused her really to sort of lose her ability to care for herself, care for her children. And Malcolm X had a very troubled childhood, very troubled teenage years. Ultimately, he moves to New York and got into quite a bit of trouble. He was uh, doing a lot of drugs, um, stealing, and ends up actually going to prison. So he has this very sort of unusual, well, not unusual, but this very different life story from Martin Luther King in some ways. Very troubled, very traumatic, doesn't go to college, but he does go to prison. And while he's in prison, he meets a man who converts him to Islam. So he becomes a Muslim in prison. But he doesn't just become any kind of Muslim. He actually joins a particular branch of Islam. And the branch of Islam that he joins is called the Nation of Islam. And it is a very particular branch of Islam, particular only to the United States. You're not going to find branches of the Nation of Islam outside of the United States. And it was run by a man named Elijah Muhammad. And Elijah Muhammad was a, a black American man who was himself a Muslim. And preached about the, the integrity and dignity of the black man, but preached about the need for the black man to essentially pull himself out of this white man's world and to establish himself as a powerful force for um, self-respect and dignity. Members of the Nation of Islam uh, were very, uh, wore very professional clothing. They wore black suits, suit jackets, um, ties. They were, they kept their hair um, cut very conservatively, and this sort of image was intended to show the the pride of the black man to sort of take back their pride. And um, they also espoused or believed in black nationalism or black separatism. The Nation of Islam believed that the United States government was so corrupt 
was so devoid of any justice for blacks that they, in fact, actually needed to separate themselves from the white America and to actually establish an entirely new nation. And so Malcolm X becomes a a, a spokesman for this cause. And so Malcolm X's um, uh, writings and speeches are all focused on this idea of, you know, why are you letting your oppressor, you know, these are the kinds of things Malcolm X would say, why would you let your oppressor define you? Why would you let your oppressor tell you how to think about yourself and write your history? Plymouth Rock, um, very famously, he said, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us. He also talked about disagreeing with Ma Martin Luther King's ideas of turning the other cheek and told black men to have pride in themselves and to defend themselves against the brutality and violence that the white man was putting upon them. And so these two messages are really, really different. And one of the rationales and one of the things historians often uh, look at is why did the message of Martin Luther King become the dominant message? Why is it that when I ask my students about the civil rights movement and civil rights leaders, why is it that they know Martin Luther King but very few know about Malcolm X? And what some historians have written about is that Martin Luther King is a much more pal palatable and his message was much more agreeable to white America and still is. Malcolm X and the message of the Nation of Islam is much more aggressive and, in, and very confrontational. And so white America doesn't feel quite as comfortable with that message, or perhaps still doesn't feel quite as comfortable with that message as we can with the message of someone like Martin Luther King, who approached this nonviolent, sort of passive resistance kind of model. But nevertheless, Mar Malcolm X's impact was enormous. And as the civil rights movement moves on, these sort of voices of protest and these voices, these alternative voices, really take rise. And as the Black Power Movement, which is the next series, um, next lecture in the series, as the Black Power Movement emerges, Martin Luther King's um, message of nonviolence, even he himself starts to question whether or not this strict nonviolent resistance movement is entirely effective. So that's the next lecture. Where we're going to talk about black power, uh, black pride, and um, these alternative voices. So, okay. Thank you.